Hello, I'm Sue Romanoff from Edison Group, and today I'm joined by Dan Carlin, Chief Medical Officer of MindMed. Hi, Dan. Hey, Sue. How are you? Great. So psilocybin is likely the most widely studied psychedelic and psychiatric disorder, including anxiety. Could you explain how psilocybin differs from the therapies MindMed is investigating? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one would be forgiven for thinking that psilocybin is the most studied uh, drug, and it, and it has been in this sort of uh, recent reinvigoration of research into psychedelics and adjacent uh, molecules. So certainly if you look at, at the papers that have come out in the last uh, five to 10 years, it does seem like there's more interest in psilocybin perhaps than other psychedelics. Uh, we then can look further back at the sort of the origins of the of the idea that, that psychedelics and similar medicines are, are useful treatments for psychiatry, uh, you know, back into the, the 40s and 50s, where we see that, that LSD, which is our lead molecule, uh, we call it uh, MM120 is our pharmaceutically optimized version of LSD, and, and see that, in fact, tens of thousands of patients were dosed uh, across uh, thousands of studies with LSD in that original era. And so when you when you kind of are forced to ask the question, why has interest seemed so high in psilocybin and possibly lower in LSD in the in the modern era, it's almost a, an accident or a, an artifact of how these drugs were able to reemerge. And so the the academic psychiatrists who uh, uh, were, were looking at the the historical potential for these drugs and trying to figure out how can we bring these forward into the modern medicines era thought they would just have an easier time with deans and popular perception and ethics committees using psilocybin because so often we look at natural things as being safer or healthier or, or, or less, you know, less harmful or less regulated. And, and that does sort of play out across, you know, a, a range of, um, of different substances where there are pseudo equivalent substances, some of which are synthetic and others are uh, naturally occurring. Of course, the psilocybin that's being used now in, in the major research studies is in fact synthetic psilocybin, but really the, the, the modern drive that seemed to be led by psilocybin had as much to do with trying to get these molecules to be available again and, and seeing an easier path with psilocybin. Now, what are the actual uh, differences between between say psilocybin and uh, and LSD? Well, they're all they're part of the same family of psychedelics, and th that family also includes DMT. Uh, the the subjective effects seem largely similar uh, between between these molecules. You know, they're of course dose dependent, and it's important to remember that the there's a, a massive potency difference between LSD and psilocybin. So the you know a hundred micrograms of LSD, that 0 0.1 milligram is equivalent to 15 milligrams or 15,000 micrograms of psilocybin. So it's 150 times potency difference. So we're talking about really radically different doses to get the same effects, much, much lower with LSD. But, but ultimately, and, and some of our colleagues at uh, University Hospital Basel did a, a recent comparative study of just LSD at 100 and 200 micrograms and uh, psilocybin at 15 and 30 milligrams and found almost no difference. The, the LSD produced slightly higher ratings on, of ineffability, uh, which <laughs> itself is hard to describe what ineffability is, except maybe means something's difficult to describe. Um, but other than that, there were some mild differences in blood pressure and heart rate elevation. Uh, LSD seemed to drive slightly higher heart rate, psilocybin slightly higher blood pressure. But basically, uh, they, they seem to work via the same mechanism, and aside from the potency difference, are, are largely very, very similar molecules. There's also some uh, duration difference. So uh, uh, LSD's effects can persist for, for a bit longer than psilocybin, but, uh, you know, and so in mass, you get slightly longer duration. Uh, that doesn't necessarily hold true for, for every individual. Um, the other, it's worth noting just that the, you know, the other drug that we're uh, primarily working on right now is not a psychedelic. And in our world, it's very easy to conflate a bunch of different classes of drugs into the single class, which is psychedelics. So when people talk about, say, ketamine, ketamine is not a psychedelic. It's a, it's a dissociative anesthetic. Um, MDMA, which you know is being developed as a therapeutic, uh, uh, sort of the therapeutic aid for psychotherapy, 
is not a psychedelic, it's an uh, empathogen. Uh, we are working with our MDMA, not as a, a psychotherapeutic aid, but rather as a drug that potentially could be dosed on a more regular basis for folks with autism spectrum disorder. So, so uh, you know, kind of across the board, we're working on things that are maybe similar to, but also have some certain key differences from, from things that uh, others in the field are working on. You, you mentioned this earlier, but could you provide an overview of the phase 2B study investigation of MM120 and generalized anxiety disorder? Yeah, of course. So in August of last year, we initiated uh, our, our phase 2B study of LSD for generalized anxiety disorder. And this is a, it's a dose range finding study. So primarily what we're, we're looking at is uh, four doses of LSD and a placebo arm. We're enrolling 200 participants, so that would be 25 per arm. Uh, the different dose, uh, dose, different doses really are uh, either placebo, 25, 50, 100, or 200 micrograms of LSD. And then the, primarily what we're looking at is the uh, outcome of the Hamilton anxiety scale, which is a, a well-established scale that's used in almost every drug study of generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and we're looking at four, eight, and 12 weeks uh, as, our, as our primary key secondary uh, outcome. So really what we're looking at is, is just what it sounds like we'd be looking at, which is change in level of anxiety uh, and durability of that change over time after a single dose session with, uh, with a, a variety of doses of LSD. Could we do something similar for uh, your, your ongoing phase 2A study of MM120 and ADHD? Yeah, yeah. So, so the ADHD study with MM120 is a little different, right? In the in the LSD GAD work, we're looking at a single dose session, right? Where someone goes into a site and has has the dose session, and depending on the dose someone receives, they may have different subjective effects during that dose session. And then the person leaves the center and they come back periodically to be reassessed. That that's one model for treatment with. Uh, psychedelics and psychedelic adjacent uh, medicines. The ADHD study of MM120 is, is looking at a, a substantially different dosing paradigm, which is uh, 20 micrograms. So remember, we talked before about these different doses. Now, the lowest dose in our GAD study is 25 micrograms. So it's a little lower than that. And it's 20 micrograms not dosed in a single dosing session, but it's 20 micrograms dosed every third day over six weeks. And we're looking at a change in what's called the uh, AISRS, which is a, a, just like the HAMA is an investigator rated scale rather than a self-report, the AISRS is an investigator rating scale for ADHD. And it looks at things like hyperactivity and inattention, just as you'd, you'd expect, right? The core symptoms of the disorder. And so we're looking to see if this repeat dosing of MM120 can ultimately change uh, the symptoms of ADHD over time. That's really helpful. I mean, thank you, Dan, for, for taking the time here to help us understand your company. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. If you'd like to learn more about MyMed, please refer to edisongroup.com. Thank you.